what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmaid to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. Students, faculty, staff, fellows, trustees, board members, and friends of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, those from other schools of the Graduate Theological Union here in Berkeley, to visitors from the University of California at Berkeley, to other visitors, and to our online viewers, good evening and welcome. My name is Father Brian Kromholtz, Academic Dean of the Dominican School and Professor of Philosophy, excuse me, professor of theology here. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that was a, that's a, what that's about, but it's my privilege to serve at least as the moderator of tonight's Aquinas lecture, which is not only be a presentation but also a, a dialogue. And we anticipate that our exchange will indeed be a dialogue. First of all, in its subject matter. Now, this evening's presentation is an interdisciplinary engagement in itself, considering philosophical aspects of what presents itself as a very theological topic, an intellectually rigorous exploration of what may be said of the living God. At our school, we promote exactly this kind of scholarship, closely studying contemporary debates and developments in thought and bringing them into dialogue with the rich tradition of classical philosophy and Catholic theology, especially as exemplified by St. Thomas Aquinas's work. But when I mention his work, <clears throat> I mean not only the content of what he said, I also mean his manner of working. The second way we intend that this presentation will be a, a dialogue, that is, there will be not only the opportunity to hear from our presenter, but a chance to ask questions afterwards and further opportunity to continue the conversation afterward with him and with one another. And speaking of continuing the con conversation in a way this very uh, Aquinas Lecture is a kind of um, foretaste and promise of the philosophy project that the Dominican School is launching, this five-year project of which you received a, a notice, God Made Manifest, Revelation, Natural Theology, and the Human Experience of God. And so this um, lecture tonight, this presentation and our discussion will be about, uh, in some sense, that very topic. So the format for this evening is rather straightforward. After um, the introduction of the speaker will be the presentation and then followed by a question and discussion period and that will end no later than 9 p.m. and then a reception will follow. So to introduce our speaker is DSPT Professor of Philosophy and 2009 Aquinas Lecturer, Dr. Bar Marga Vega. Good evening. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's Aquinas' lecture speaker, Father Justin Gable. And many of you uh, already know he is one of our own. He works here at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology as assistant professor of philosophy. After studying philosophy at the University of San Francisco, Father Justin completed his PhD in philosophy at Fordham University and his studies in theology at the Graduate Theological Union. Besides being a member of the American Maritain Association, where he served from uh, 2012 to 2016, he is also a member of the American Catholic Philosophical Association, the American Philosophical Association, and the Society for Phenomenology and Existential Philosophy. He is also currently Regent of Studies for the Western Dominican province. 
But one of the advantages of presenting one of our own faculty members is that as colleagues, we have sort of a privileged access. <laughs> An insider's view beyond what we can all read on the internet. And if you haven't had the opportunity to experience Father Justin's philosophical style, then here there are three facts, just three, <laughs> that you may be interested in. One fact, number one, is that Father Justin teaches philosophy with wit, goes straight to, with a sharp mind, to the crucial philosophical problems, and this is a clear sign of uh, the best philosophers. Fact number two is that he brings joviality and a sense of humor to philosophy and into our faculty and student interactions. It is not hard to see that students finding Father Justin a terrific advisor and a great thesis advisor. Sorry for the advertisement. It must make it you more <laughs> students than you already have. <laughs> Fact number three is that Father Justin moves at ease between phenomenology and Thomism, all while keeping an attentive eye to, into, on the analytic tradition. He doesn't lose sight of that. And integrating in the process philosophy with theology. His education, teaching, research, and public speaking has been one of interaction among these rich sources and his contributions reflect the fruitfulness that we obtain from placing these different voices in dialogue. Many of us have had the chance to enjoy, either directly or through our YouTube channel, his series on Aquinas in conversation with contemporary culture. In those talks, he has had Aquinas take on the Supreme Court on natural law and human rights, he has invited Aquinas and Jean-Paul Chartres to walk into a French cafe and discuss the meaning of freedom and existence, or he has managed to get Richard Dawkins to meet Aquinas on religion and science. I see the topic that he will present tonight as an opening act for a series of conversations that Father Ryan already mentioned, that under the title God Made Manifest will take place next semester, starting in the fall, our faculty will explore the nature of religious experience and mysticism, revelation, negative theology, divine, divine action, God's existence, atheism, prophecy, miracles. However, any coherent philosophical discourse about God in the post postmodern thought will require laying out the metaphysical soil able to harvest such conversation. Father Justin's Gable topic for this evening, God after metaphysics, Heidegger, Aquinas, and the future of natural theology, addresses precisely this crucial preparatory task. The description of tonight's lecture reads that Father Justin will explain why Aquinas' natural theology not only remains a viable enterprise, but is still one of the most intellectually satisfying accounts of God. I leave it to him to enlighten us with, it, with his expertise. Please welcome Father Justin Gable. Thank you very much for those lovely introductions. <clears throat> I apologize, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm a little bit uh, more throaty than I usually am, if you'll bear with me. Tonight I'll be using a term called continental philosophy of religion, and I thought I should just go ahead and, for those of you who don't know anything about that, just say a little bit about what that is before I begin. So if you were to have way too much free time on your hands and headed to your local university library, say the G2 library up the street, and went to the philosophy of religion section, you'd actually find, um, in addition to historical studies and things of that sort, uh, you would find essentially two radically different genres, I would, I would describe them as. One is a, a genre that's completely comfortable using metaphysical terminology, that uses conceptual reasoning, and makes frequent recourse to proofs for the existence of God. This is analytic philosophy of religion, 
Uh, this is something that Thomists are, generally speaking, a little bit more comfortable with because it's a little bit closer to what Aquinas himself did. And this would include such famous names as Alvin Plantica, William Lane Craig, and Richard Swinburne. Continental philosophy of religion is a little bit of a different animal. It is an approach to the study of religious phenomena that really does keep things in experiential terms and is very, very hesitant to not only draw, I would say, conclusions about God in general, but to resort to anything remotely resembling the proofs for the existence of God, metaphysical terminology, or conceptual reasoning. So here I'm going to talk about what gives continental philosophy of religion something of its character. Heidegger's ontotheological critique forms the foundation, or perhaps even the heart, of the field of study known as the continental philosophy of religion. The continental style in philosophy of religion, its tendency to focus on religious phenomena in experiential terms and to avoid proofs in the use of metaphysical terminology, is certainly influenced in part by its strong and continuing ties to phenomenology. But perhaps even more influential is Heidegger's critique of, onto, of metaphysics as ontotheology. Heidegger argued that metaphysics has an abiding twofold character. First, the goal of making the totality of entities intelligible by identifying their most common or universal feature being, this would be metaphysics as ontology, and then secondly, by grounding the totality of beings in a supreme exemplary being. This would be metaphysics as theology. Since these two sides of metaphysics are necessarily intertwined, metaphysics as a whole has the character, says Heidegger, of ontotheology. And while apparently innocent, Heidegger links metaphysics as ontotheology to what he sees as a number of problematic features of traditional Western thinking. Heidegger's critique of metaphysics as ontotheology has been accepted by continental philosophers of religion as fundamental and substantive for the determination of a legitimate methodology for any philosophical approach to religious phenomena. In fact, this is so much the case that the term ontotheology actually functions, as many scholars actually admit, as a term of abuse more than a specific, well-articulated critique. To label the thought of a particular thinker as ontotheological amounts to an indictment so serious it threatens to automatically discredit his or her reflection on God. Little wonder then that so many Thomists and friends of St. Thomas have engaged Heidegger's ontotheological critique primarily by attempting to show that the thought of St. Thomas is immune to the charge of ontotheology. Now, while such a defense of St. Thomas is a worthy project, it cannot and should not, I think, be the entirety of the Thomistic reply to Heidegger and his successors. Within the project of refuting Heidegger's ontotheological charges, uh, necessarily lies the presupp presupposition, at least for the sake of argument, that Heidegger's ontotheological critique is essentially correct. Such a presupposition, of course, is something um, undesirable, we're already conceding too much. In the talk this evening, I do not wish to offer one more defense of St. Thomas. Rather, I wish to play offense <laughs> by looking at the difficulties in understanding and applying Heidegger's critique of metaphysics as ontotheology, and indeed to show how the very idea of ontotheology is itself rife with philosophically and theologically subject presuppositions. In the first part of this talk, I will examine the general contours of Heidegger's ontotheological criticism, as well as highlight some initial difficulties. Heidegger paints the history of Western philosophy with a very broad brush indeed, which should give even those who do not have the natural postmodern suspicion of grand narratives to pause to consider the plausibility of the context within which Heidegger's ontotheological critique finds its meaningful application. Heidegger's declaration of the end of metaphysics and the possibility of its overcoming relies heavily on his own account of being, an account which is not only obscure and problematic, or at least not unproblematic, but whose articulation was con continuously being modified and updated by Heidegger. Uh, 
And even if we accept Heidegger's account of being and the resulting interpretation of Western metaphysics, it is far from clear that Heidegger himself has provided us with sufficient resources for overcoming onto theology. In the second part of this paper, I want to take a brief look at the results of non onto theological phenomenological philosophy of religion post Heidegger. Yes, I just did a tongue twister there. Has the onto theological critique actually given risen to richer accounts of the divine? Has it provided a touchstone that has furthered alternative substantial approaches to the understanding of religious experience and religious phenomena? I will argue that the fruits of Heidegger's onto theological critique are very mixed. There are a number of phenomenological thinkers that have explored other avenues toward an understanding of religious phenomena, but I will focus on two in particular, two of the most popular and well-known, especially here in the United States, John Caputo and Richard Carney. I will use their accounts of God and religious belief to argue that phenomenologies of religion can suffer from shortcomings as potentially devastating as any alleged onto theological philosophy they were meant to supplant. Using Heidegger's critique as an inspiration, continental philosophers of religion have long complained that approaching God via metaphysics amounts to subjecting God to our own project of trying to make the world intelligible, a kind of idolatry that only allows God to appear on our terms. If the thought of Caputo and Carney are at all representative, however, Post-Heideggerian non-ontotheological philosophy includes a tendency to focus entirely on the human element of religion and the divine um, really becomes even more instrumental to human rationality and human agendas than any traditional natural philosophy um, that you'll find in such thinkers as Aquinas and Aristotle, not less. Finally, in the last portion of the talk, I wish to subject the ontotheological critique to a more substantive criticism by looking at the criteria which make a philosophical theology supposedly an ontotheological enterprise. I will be using Merrill Westfall's analysis, and I wish to question each of the criteria he provides to suggest that far from being decisive, these criteria actually suggest that ontotheology is a relatively empty charge and that classical philosophical theology still contains rich, satisfying intellectual possibilities. And whatever Heidegger and other continental philosophers of religion might claim, it has not outlived its usefulness. So, thus to the task. Elements of Heidegger's ontotheological critique can be found in a variety of his texts from the 1930s onward. One of the most important of these texts is entitled The Ontotheological Constitution of Metaphysics, an essay originally presented as the concluding lecture of a seminar on Hegel's science of logic during the winter semester of 1956 to 57. In this essay, Heidegger undertook the task of carefully uncovering and identifying the essential nature of metaphysics which he characterized again as a dual movement, a movement from a thinking of beings to being as the most universal characteristic shared by beings, and a second simultaneous movement from beings to the being which is the highest or the first, that is, God or the deity. Thus, the search for a ground of being and the unity of beings inevitably results in these two movements, both an ontological movement from beings or individual entities to being itself as the most general character of beings and a theological movement from beings to God the highest being. Quote, metaphysics thinks of the being of beings both in the ground given unity of what is most general, what is indifferently valid everywhere, and also in the unity of the all that accounts for the ground that is of the all highest. The being of beings is thus thought of in advance as the grounding ground. Yes, this is what makes study of Heidegger so rich and fun. The project of conceiving being primarily in terms of the presence and perdurance of entities and then searching for the ground or foundation of this presence is both the most general feature and most supreme instance of such entities. That is essentially what Heidegger means when he says ontotheology. Okay. <clears throat> 
So, Heidegger's critique is supplemented and extended to some extent in other parts of his Gesamtausgabe. Uh, we won't go into that. For our purposes, suffice it to say that both in the ontological constitution of metaphysics and elsewhere, Heidegger is never altogether clear about why ontotheology is so bad. The most plausible account seems to be the following. On the philosophical side, it would seem ontotheology presents difficulties for the adequate understanding of what Heidegger calls the ontological difference. That is, the difference between entities or individual beings and being itself, and a full appreciation of the various possibilities for understanding that being. Ontotheology, or metaphysics, has construed being as presence or perdurance, and this has been a substantial limitation to a true understanding of beings in their full being. In other words, metaphysics has facilitated the forgetfulness or confusion between beings and being. Heidegger also suggests some problems to theology, and I know you will all breathe a sigh of relief when I say these will really be the focus of our efforts tonight. Heidegger also suggests that onto theology says God himself must be subjected to a particular conception of being. Although highest, he is but one more instance of such a concept. He is subordinated to the project of explicating and dominating beings, and as so subjected and subordinated, he is an abstract god of the philosophers, causa sui. Quote, man can neither pray nor sacrifice to this god. Before the causa sui, man can neither fall to his knees in awe, nor can he play music and dance before this god. The fact that we can't dance before this god would probably not upset too many Dominican brothers. <laughs> Finally, Heidegger closely links onto theology with the modern terminal, uh, technological mindset. The quest for intellectual domination of being in onto theological thinking inspires and maintains a technological attitude towards beings in general, which seeks to dominate and master the world on a practical level. So there's that connection between onto theology and a uh, attitude of uh, technocracy, we might say. There are a number of places where Heidegger suggests that really all of Western metaphysics is onto theology. That is, even Western languages are languages of metaphysical thinking. So it's not only that particular metaphysical systems or particular philosophers within the history of Western metaphysics happen to be onto theology, uh, theological. So not just Aristotle or Spinoza or Hegel, let us say, but indeed the entirety of the history of metaphysics is essentially so, from the very earliest thinkers uh, to the present day, with perhaps Heidegger himself as an exception. This is also what seems to follow from Heidegger's own account of being, for Heidegger being is always only partially unveiled. Any given historical epic only catches sight of certain aspects of being, and this, as Heidegger suggests, the result of being's own possibilities, which are always caught up in a dialectic of concealment and unconcealment, revelation and self-effacement. And thus, it would seem to follow that the entire history of Western metaphysics can be characterized by a particular limited experiential access to being, beginning from the very start in ancient Greece, and this, is, again, is summed up entirely by Heidegger's idea of ontotheology. Now, for the purposes of time, I'm going to skip uh, a few pages. Suffice it to say that Heidegger himself is not entirely convincing in all the details which underscore his ontotheological critique, his uh, own theory of being, his own solution to what constitutes the holy and the profane the character of the divine and its relationship to humankind. All of these things are, uh, in grand Heideggerian fashion, somewhat amorphous. And even when they're not amorphous, they seem not entirely uh, plausible. So there are a number of uh, continental philosophers of religion that accept the ontotheological critique, but take what I call a historical or thin version of this ontotheological critique that is, they essentially are able to uh, separate it from its Heideggerian context and use it without necessarily taking along all the Heideggerian baggage. 
This will be the model for our uh, reflection tonight, if for no other reason than it will free us from having to have a prolonged discussion of uh, the ins and outs of Heideggerian uh, thinking and, uh, and really focus on ontotheology as such, as a charge, as a legitimate or illegitimate critique. For the purposes of our discussion tonight, I will adopt Merrill Westfall's analysis of the critique of ontotheology. He encapsulates Heidegger's ontotheological critique using four criteria. A particular system of thought is ontotheological if, one, it makes use of only impersonal rather than personal categories to speak of and understand of God. Two, it only allows God to make an appearance within the terms allowed by human reason and its desire to understand the world, in effect reducing God to a mere function of the principle of sufficient reason. Three, it entails a loss of mystery as God is reduced to only what can be entirely mastered by the resources of metaphysical thinking. And four, it is religiously useless, presenting a God that cannot be worshipped or prayed to since he is but a cog and intellectual system. I will use these criteria from Westfall in what follows, not only because they are arguably the clearest and most concrete synopsis of Heidegger's thought on this issue, <clears throat> but because they also render intuitive what is really at stake in the ontotheological critique. Before I criti critically examine these various criteria for what counts as ontotheology, though, it might be helpful for us to first to turn to a couple of examples of non-ontotheological philosophy. What happens when we attempt to avoid all metaphysical language and causal reasoning. Two advocates for a continuing post-ontotheological discourse, both appealing to the resources of phenomenology, are John Caputo and Richard Carney. Both insist on and explore a non-metaphysical way of talking about God <clears throat> in an attempt to avoid relying on any ontotheological techniques. Both agree that discourse about God must begin with finding God amidst human experience, although Caputo and Carney differ on which experiences provide that access to God and precisely how those experiences do so. For John Caputo, his phenomenological account of God centers on the idea of impossibility. Quote, the impossible will be the bridge this crucial middle term in my logic that links God and experience. I will pursue the hypothesis that the experience of the impossible makes the experience of God possible, or to put it slightly differently, that we love God but we, because we cannot help but love the impossible. Caputo is clear that this notion of the impossible is neither a logical nor a metaphysical one. By impossibility, he is not referring to the logical negation of the possible, but something phenomenological, namely that which shatters the horizon of expectation and foreseeability. In other words, for Caputo, the language of impossibility does not designate what is literally impossible, logically or physically, but what seems impossible given the concrete circumstances of a given situation. Caputo credits Derrida with the inspiration behind his notion of the impossible and also points to the idea of paradox as expounded by Kierkegaard's Johannes Climacus. Caputo argues that impossibility in this sense is a consistent feature of experience considered in its full intensity, passion, and adventurousness. For any human desire, passion, or power is brought to fulfillment only in reaching its limit. Desire is only truly and fully desire when it yearns for what is beyond its reach. Intelligence discovers its end, its ultimacy, only when it seeks to reach that which is beyond understanding. Quote, thus a power is most intensely itself only when it is brought to a standstill, brought to the point that it breaks up or breaks open and is forced beyond itself, unquote. Such a seeking of the impossibility of the conditions of possibility is part of the character of experience, if we understand experience in its risk, 
its adventurousness, its passion. As Caputo reminds us, the easy humdrum drift of everydayness is experienced only in the minimal and negative sense. To make his point, Caputo frequently appeals to various passages of scripture, including the Annunciation, Jesus' discourse on faith and salvation, and, uh, and others leading him to conclude that the mark of God's kingdom is that there, uh, that there impossibility becomes possibile, adinaton becomes dinaton. The characteristic of the impossible is likewise the mark of the theological virtues. Faith in the kingdom shares in the characterization of being oriented towards the possible. For anything short of believing in the impossible is not faith, but prudence and calculation. The domain of the possible is still playing the odds, the retention of control rather than abandonment to what will be. And opposed to the unqualified openness to the absolutely unforeseeable that constitutes the true virtue of hope. And love, too, dwells in the realm of the impossible, since only within the experience of the impossible is the limit of passion to be found, as well as unconditional gift without reasonable expectation of return. There are a number of points of interest in Caputo's case for the linkage between God and the experience of the impossible, but there are certainly a few serious problems with Caputo's account, at least from a Thomistic standpoint. A Thomist would, for instance, certainly dispute the characterization of the fulfillment of human desire and the powers of our various faculties as achieved only in their breakdown and impossibility. But really the most serious difficulty for Caputo's account is broached by Caputo himself. Despite Caputo's close identification of God and experience, the question remains as to why the experience of impossibility provides the basis for an experience of God, rather than simply an experience of tragedy, say, in the case of where impossibility never becomes possible, or an experience of chance or luck when, in fact, impossibility does beat the odds. Both experiences of the impossible, in this sense, would be without God. Caputo gives a very honest answer to this question. It may not. There may be no difference. Quote, there is an ineradicable undecidability here between God and the gods, the gift of God and the gift of chance, mysterious love and blind chance between different ways to regard the gift and to treat the course of events whose discernment constitutes the stuff of what I like to call a more radical hermeneutics. Let's be clear, Caputo here is not simply contending that there are two possible ways of reading the experience of the impossible, one which results in the experience of God and the other which only provides the experience of chance or luck, but that it is the same experience and it is radically undecidable which it is. There is no evidence to appeal to, says Caputo, that would allow us to adjudicate between the two interpretations. And indeed, Caputo even suggests that the difference is not important after all. Quote, but might the experience of God be no more than a name we have for the experience of the impossible and the love of God be no more than a name we have for our love of the impossible? Perhaps. But now we ask, as long as our hopes against hope and loves beyond love, does that matter? Recalling that para of experience and praxis share a common root, does not a certain transformation into praxis occur at this point in virtue of which the experience of God and the experience of the impossible are caught up in a cognitive fluctuation that is resolved in the doing, in loving God in spirit and in truth? in spending oneself on behalf of the democracy to come? Could it be that the experience of God is given in an experience which, in which the name of God never comes up? Now, from a Thomistic standpoint, all I have to say, it is hard to avoid feeling that we are now talking nonsense. For in, one sense, in what sense can we speak meaningfully about an experience of God in the impossible when that experience cannot be differentiated from its opposite? In what sense can we speak of experiencing God when the very name and person of God might be annulled 
without changing the character of the experience. The pivot to praxis is unfortunately no less satisfactory. How is our work on behalf of the kingdom of God understood without reference to God? It would seem to confuse God and his kingdom with the vague orientation to the common good or some future utopian condition. It is difficult to see how Caputo's phenomenological reflections on the impossible as the experience of God do not begin to break down. We see this in a particular powerful way in Caputo's characterizations of the theological virtues, which although provocative, is ultimately unsatisfying. While he wishes to distinguish faith, hope, and love from ordinary belief, expectation, and affection, and we should certainly applaud him in this, we also find the theological virtues curiously untethered to their ground in God, and instead connected only to the, the formal requirement of impossibility. The theological virtues derive their unique character from uniting us directly to God as their proper object. So it is odd to speak of them without reference to their end, which of course is the very basis for their individuation and distinction as virtues. Further, without reference to God himself as a being, as a person or community of persons, as faithful and loving and able to keep his promises, there is no reason for our hope, no ground for our faith, and no source for our charity. According to St. Thomas in the tradition, faith, hope, and love are not a leap into sheer impossibility, completely unmotivated and contrary to reason. Far from it, we have faith in God as eminently trustworthy. We hope in his promises because he is the one who can and will make good on them and we love him as our supreme and perfect good. Without the connection to a personal God with certain identifiable attributes, the theological virtues become virtually incomprehensible. Why look for God in this particular phenomena, the experience of the impossible? Why is it in the highest pitch of experience that God should be found? Why identify God so closely with one particular kind of experience rather than another? Might we not see God as a source of the ordinary and the reliable, the homely and the comfortable, the familiar and the constant? Why it connect him exclusively with the impossible? Why indeed, Richard Carney would say. Richard Carney's approach to the experience of God is in many ways the mirror image of John Caputo's. Carney emphasizes the experience of the sacred in the familiar, the ordinary, and the everyday. We should, he suggests, experience the ultimate in the mundane, quote, for it is often in the most quotidian, broken, inconsequential, and minute of events that the divine signals to us, end quote. Carney refers to this as an ana aesthetics, the sacred embodied in the most minute and transient material circumstances. The ana meaning up, in place or time, back, again, or anew, refers to an attitude, a way of experiencing which draws us both, quote, back to the first genesis and at the same time forward to the final kingdom, to that eschaton dwelling in each unique material instant, no matter how lowly or profane. End quote. In the movement of faith in the life of the believer, annex, anna signifies a re repeating forward, a retrieval of the presence of God after and through the absence of God. We inevitably experience privative moments, times of loss, loneliness, feelings of being lost or abandoned, and such moments return us and open us up to further possibilities of what has already been, who we already are and what we have experienced. Like Caputo, Carney turns to Kierkegaard, but this time to Johannes de Silencio's leap of faith and Constantine Constantius's concept of repetition. After an experience of loss, whether it be personal and existential in the form of a dark night of the soul or historical and cultural with the death of God and contemporary secular humanism, whatever it might be, there is a new sense of God, a new space of belief, a new set of possibilities for an experience of the infinite and sacred come to life. 
Carney sums up his account and this entire movement of rediscovery with the term anatheism. Carney suggests that the negative atheistic movement of anatheism comprises a particular moment of openness and choice, a space or perspective by which human freedom can be exercised in relation to the divine, making possible a genuine response to the divine call and a moment of awareness that is the precondition for the recognition of the sacred. Quote, theism without anatheism is a violation of human freedom and trust, end quote. With this negative moment of absence, perspective, and decision comes the sense, quote, of the sacred in its most basic deep sense that there is something more, something radically other, uncanny, transcendent, impossible for us to imagine until we reimagine it anew, until we make the impossible possible through the leap of faith, end quote. Together with anatheism, Carney conceives of God as a God of possibility, the God who may be. Like Caputo, Carney is clear that his idea of possibility is not metaphysical and cannot be understood as the mere absence of contradiction or necessity, although it is contrasted to act or actuality, which Carney identifies with ontotheology. Beyond logical or real possibility, Carney wishes to speak of God as the God of promises. For Carney, this has the double advantage of allowing us to speak of God in personal terms as well as avoiding emphasizing traditional attributes of God, such as God's eternity, omnipotence, omniscience, all of which place God in conflict with human freedom. Rather, the God who may be leaves himself vulnerable to human activity. For God's promises are conditional, and like the divine promises of the covenant between God and Israel, God cannot bestow his blessings upon us unless we obey unless we ourselves work for the promise. Thus, for Carney, God himself takes on a conditional character, the name of a promise, an ideal that may be, but is as dependent upon us as we are on him. God thus conceived as a God of hope, an eschatological God of promises and possibilities dependent on human action for realization. There are a number of difficulties with Carney's account of God, as you've already heard. Carney's move to a God who may be, for the most part, is what I would call in my logic class a non sequitur. Even if God's promises are conditional, this does not make God himself conditional, rather the opposite. If promises are made, there must be a promiser, and this promiser must be actual, not merely possible. While Carney's account seems to be fashioned to preserve human freedom, avoid metaphysical categories, and speak immediately and consistently of God as personal, it is far from obvious that he has achieved any of these goals. To weaken God or render him non-existent in the interest of preserving human freedom is the humanistic logic to be found in 19th century atheism. And such humanist, anti-theistic logic is only justified if God indeed is a rival, either practically or metaphysically, with human freedom. But a properly Christian understanding of God sees him both as the giver and the end and goal of our human freedom. There is no need to deprive God of actuality in order to secure human autonomy. Further, while Carney makes a similar move to Caputo in insisting on the experiential rather than the metaphysical character of possibility, it is not at all clear that he is successful in doing so. Possibility cannot, it seems to me, be understood, but in terms of actuality, whether or not we choose to label the term as metaphysical. We only understand possibility in terms of what it is a possibility or potentiality for, that is, in terms of its corresponding actuality. We could not even make sense of God's promises were we not able to have some understanding of what it might mean for them to come true, that is, to become actual. Finally, though characterizing God as the God of promises seems like a reliable strategy for avoiding the use of impersonal categories, Carney's treatment of God strikes one, in the last analysis, as being extraordinarily abstract. A God whose actuality is lacking, or at least in question, takes on more of the character of an abstract ideal than a real person. Now, Carney and Caputo insist that their accounts do not contradict one another. 
And I think this is essentially correct. While Carney's emphasis on the possible and the quotidian is in many, way, there are many ways the precise inverse to Caputo's uh, emphasis on the impossible and the extraordinary, I do not believe that we can make the contrary emphasis. Um, really, we cannot render them into contradictories. Nevertheless, we should be left wondering, I think, what the specific character of the experience of God actually amounts to if we can begin from the experience of possibility or the quotidian as the privileged point of experiential contact with God, just as much as from the impossibility and the passion of experience in its most extreme and adventurous forms. Carney and Caputo are both convincing in their own way, but to have it both ways is less to embrace a contradiction than to implicitly deny that God can be identified or especially disclosed in any particular kind of experience. And such a denial certainly seems to go to the heart of Caputo and Carney's thinking. Both Carney and Caputo are sensitive to the accusation that they fall into ontotheology. Both are at pains to explicitly identify their approach as phenomenological and experiential, and both are careful to insist that they are not speaking of possibility or impossibility as concepts tied to metaphysical patterns of thought. While an appeal to the foundations of their accounts of possibility and impossibility and experience provides initially plausible rejoinder to the ontotheological charge, I am not entirely convinced that it holds up to scrutiny. The dichotomy between the experiential and the metaphysical presumed by such a response is itself suspect. From whence do we derive metaphysical concepts after all? There is an experiential sense of being and existence from which being and the fundamental metaphysical concepts which follow in its wake first arise. As we know, St. Thomas Aquinas said, being is the first intelligible. Likewise, once such concepts have been formulated, they inform our experience of the world, tending to be replied, to be reapplied, even when we might wish to avoid them. While the understanding of being might be better hidden in Carney and Caputo, it is naive to think that it does not play some role in their thought. But for now, let us give Carney and Caputo the benefit of the doubt, for there are bigger problems. Caputo's final appeal to praxis and working for the democracy to come ought to be a particular concern to both Thomas and ordinary believing Christians. One of the overarching concerns behind Heidegger's ontotheological critique and its appropriation by many in the continental tradition is to avoid a kind of intellectual idolatry, rendering God intelligible at the risk of eliminating divine transcendence, mystery, and the possibility of worship. Ontotheology is said to reduce God to our intellectual agenda of making the world intelligible, demanding that God enter into a grand metaphysical system on its terms rather than his. And after such intellectual violence, God, now a correlate of a mere human idea, is more readily at our disposal to justify human ideologies, political agendas, and power struggles as we see fit. But does he fare any better in the hands of Carney or Caputo, who see God largely as a function of human experience? Is God in a better position when he is so thoroughly identified with experience or a set of experiences? Is God any more resistant to ideology when he is so self-effacing as to be indistinguishable from luck or chance? Is faith itself made more intelligible to being, um, by being so interchangeable with its opposite, that is, uh, luck or chance? Oftentimes it is assumed that negative theology, that is, the silence or unsane of the being or attributes of God, is what can protect God from idolatry best. But a God without metaphysics, without being or attributes, a God without definite content, would appear to be perhaps even more vulnerable than a God whose being is articulated in metaphysical ontotheological categories. If our only post-metaphysical, non-ontotheological move 
is to identify God with particular human experiences, then it would seem that God is actually even more radically subject to human priorities and agendas. There is so little content left to the very name of God that, as Caputo indicates, we seem to be able to do without it. And such conclusions might be drawn from Carney as well. And with little content, we have little to say in defense of God when he is identified with a particular agenda or ideology. Now here I'd like to return to Merrill Westfall's four attributes of ontotheological critique. First, ontotheology as conceived of God in impersonal rather than personal categories. Secondly, as only allowing God to appear according to the predetermined possibilities of a system whose very parameters are subject to the human agenda of making the world intelligible. Thirdly, as eliminating divine transcendence and mystery. And finally, as rendering God religiously useless, making him so abstract as to be impossible to worship. Rather than argue that it is doubtful that many approaches to God which claim to be non or post ontotheological actually fail to meet these criteria, and I think that Caputo and Carney uh, il illustrate this quite well, I'd like to interrogate the criteria themselves now, more radically. Do metaphysical approaches to God necessarily fail these criteria? And do these criteria themselves pass muster? Or should we not question the validity of these criteria? First on the list is treating God in personal rather than impersonal categories. While we may find personal categories more appealing than impersonal ones, what is it about impersonal categories that we find objectionable? There are a few reasons we might be suspicious of a rigorous dichotomy between personal and impersonal and the insistence on only the former. First, the very concept of person, and therefore the personal, is metaphysically laden. We've been examining this for three years here at the DSPT. The very concept of the personhood of God is historically linked to the resolution of certain Trinitarian and Christological disputes, disputes which were resolved by early Christian theologians precisely by recourse to Greek philosophical categories, metaphysical categories, terms like usia and hypostasis and prosopon. The very concept of person, and thus personal categories, are infected with non-personal categories, which, as we know, are allegedly themselves ontotheological. Given this fact, it would be hard to maintain a rigorous distinction. Secondly, we might extrapolate from the historical point to a more general philosophical point. To understand the personal self requires recourse to impersonal categories, vocabularies, and characterization. We find this even in phenomenological postmodern philosophers like Levinas, who uses the categories of other and the same totality infinity to express what it means to enter into personal relationships. These considerations do not, I think, erase the distinction between impersonal and personal categories but question the use of either as an exclusive criteria for whether we have engaged in an appropriate speech about God. This objection is only heightened when we acknowledge that when we say of God, or even another human being, that he is a person, we do not intend to deny him or her actuality or existence. To claim God as personal is to attribute more to him than mere existence, not less. And indeed, if we follow the personalism of Norris Clark, personhood is the intensification of the same transcendental perfections which occur across the spectrum of being. To the second criteria. In ontotheology, God is required to enter into a philosophical system on its terms, not his. In Western metaphysics, this has meant that God is subject to the ruling first principle of sufficient reason, or causality, and the reigning conception of being. God becomes one more moving piece in the human project of subjecting the world to the requirements of reason, a demand for complete intelligibility which finds its full expression in the domination of nature by modern technology. <clears throat> 
God appears in the system as ground, as ultimate source of existence and intelligibility. We should question, however, I think, whether traditional approaches to philosophical theology, dependent as they are on metaphysics, are not necessarily so imperialistic when it comes to God, and whether they ought to be characterized as violent and domineering in principle. If we see metaphysics as contemplation of being, of what exists, we might see in approaches characterized as ontotheological an openness and receptiveness to an important dimension of the divine, namely, a divinely instituted order we experience firsthand and itself an indication, perhaps only in an imperfect and partial way, of the character of its maker. In Heidegger himself, the only alternative to an ontological technocratic attitude to the world seems that of genuine contemplation um, of letting be. This is his term for it although this alternative attitude actually gets very little elaboration in Heidegger. Can it be that Heidegger and his philosophical successors have mischaracterized much of metaphysical speculation, at least in its ancient and modern forms, uh, ancient and medieval forms, failing to grasp the reverent, contemplative, and receptive dimensions of the intellectual enterprise? It is not as far-fetched as some ontotheological critiques would make it sound. We might, for instance, turn to St. Anselm, who is often portrayed as the ontotheologian par excellence. But with his motto of fides querens intellectum, we see that the saint's belief is that the project of understanding begins with the trust and receptivity of faith. And his own writings are so interspersed with prayers and invocations as to thoroughly blend the genres of speculative theology and devotional literature. We might ask whether, despite the fact that God consistently finds a place in metaphysical reflection as ground, this character of grounding is a way of reflecting on and being attentive to the meaning of God's creative activity, his providential guidance, and his transcendent mystery. It might therefore be suggested that Western metaphysics is not so much a subjection of God to the demands of human reason, but the subjection of human reason to the demands of the inherent intelligibility within the world that is the trace of its creator. If metaphysics is understood along these lines, it is not only essentially contemplative and open to the divine, it actually presents a broader receptivity to a greater array of evidence for divine activity than those post-metaphysical phenomenological approaches which attempt to identify God with one sector or one type of human experience. Rather than attempting to link God to one dimension of human experience, possibility, impossibility, the everyday, the extraordinary, the saturated and excessive or the self-effacing and hidden, our radical responsibility to our neighbor, the sublime, the ugly, the spiritual, the enfleshed, Metaphysics has the potential to contemplate all of this and much more within the horizon of all that is. And if metaphysics is such a matter of contemplation that attends to the divine's own self-manifestation in the creative order, we see that far from necessitating a reduction of the divine mystery, metaphysics preserves a sense of the mysterious transcendence of God and is ready and open for the transformation of that contemplative understanding of the world into direct communication and worship by revelation, liturgy, and prayer. Finally, I would suggest that the implicit demand in Heidegger's ontotheological critique, the second in our list of requirements, is actually an impossibility. God cannot but appear on human reason's terms. God must meet us where we are at. If he does not appear within our fallible human horizons and subject himself to our fallible human desires and interests, he cannot appear at all. This is as true on the hermeneutic level as on the metaphysical level. Just as we do not have the virtue, the intelligence, and the power to meet him, we cannot occupy God's own divine perspective in order to interpret him according to a superhuman logic. Grace and revelation, not to mention philosophy, poor handmaiden of theology, 
cannot but build on nature and ordinary human understanding. This is the logic of the incarnation. This is the logic of the father in the parable of the prodigal son who goes out to meet his wayward younger child. God's own self-revelation always involves God's humbling himself, taking on human form in human language, as human person, body and soul, and even in the form of human food, bread and wine. In the interests of time, let these reflections, to paraphrase Aquinas, also suffice to answer objections three and four. As we have seen Heidegger's ontotheological critique, though it has attained quasi-canonical status in recent continental philosophy of religion, and despite having some philosophical merit, suffer from a, from a number of weaknesses that demand a reevaluation of its overall value and legitimacy. Current efforts to engage in religious discourse in such a manner as to avoid the critique of ontotheology do not, if my analysis is correct, seem altogether successful. And even those phenomenological treatments of religious experience which I do find compelling, much of which is happening in France right now, are no replacement for the natural theology provided by St. Thomas and the Catholic tradition. If Heidegger's ontotheological critique manages to hit the mark in some forms of metaphysics, and I think perhaps it does, the question might be better addressed not by any kind of sweeping gesture against all metaphysics as ontotheological, but a return to the simpler and more difficult question of the difference between good and bad metaphysics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Justin, for that uh, provocative uh, presentation. We have a um, number of minutes available to us for questions. So if you do have any questions, please raise your hand. I'll try. We have a roving microphone for, for the question. So uh, we have one back here, uh, uh, Dr. Katoy. Um, Father Gabel, thank you so much for your presentation. I could ask you a lot of questions, but there's one question at least that I have on my mind. There's one word that you've never used for 45 minutes, and I was waiting to see whether you would actually use it or not, and that word is analogy, because you've never said that once. It's really interesting. And I was just wondering whether, in a way, what you are suggesting is just a retrieval of uh, the sort of analogical tradition in theology, because in a way that is what allows us to get out of this false dichotomy where on one hand, you have this ontotheological critique, and on the other hand, you have a completely post-metaphysical understanding of, of the divine. And you talked about you know, reduction to experience. Some might even be used to just language or univocal predication. But in a way, analogical predication is what enables metaphysics to be experientially grounded without sort of falling into these two other traps, right? Yes, so that could right. be a way forward. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, analogy is, is a big topic, and so I, I didn't open that particular can of worms. It's actually been used quite a bit to uh, basically rebut the ontotheological charge against St. Thomas Aquinas, um, which I think is quite right. Um, in many ways, I'm trying to go deeper, though. So, for instance, Jean-Luc Marion's um, retraction. So, in his original uh, edition of God Without Being, uh, Dieu sans être, he actually uh, considers Aquinas an ontotheologian. He puts him in the ontotheological cap, camp. By the second edition, he's changed his mind. He's written kind of a retraction article, and he has a, an additional chapter basically, basically absolving Aquinas. Uh, it's very interesting. It's not always correct, even though he seems to be on the right side of things now. Um, uh, and analogy is very important to Marion and many others in vindicating Aquinas. But Marion, like uh, a few others, basically can sometimes sound like what he's saying is, St. Thomas is not an onto theologian because in the last analysis, metaphysics wasn't that important to him. And the point is, to analogy is metaphysics doesn't end up being that important. 
In many ways, I'm trying to counter that in my remarks by saying it is actually through metaphysics that, uh, and doing metaphysics well, that Aquinas actually avoids the problems that the ontotheological critique is actually trying to identify. And of course, there is a, <clears throat> a certain tension between analogy and metaphysics uh, that these accounts presuppose that you and I would really be strongly against, right? Analogy is part and parcel of the overall picture that Aquinas presents us. So thank you very much for your comment and your question. This isn't going to be too loud. Okay, good. Um, so thank you so much for a really good lecture. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to ask, um, certainly Heidegger is noted for being a very original thinker and uh, developing the tradition and taking things in a new direction. But in many, many times throughout uh, your uh, presentation, I found myself uh, thinking that this seems to be a variation on an old theme. For example, we hear, we remember Blaise Pascal had uh, irrit, uh, t sewed into his uh, jacket liner the saying, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and not the God of the philosophers. And then of also, and also we have, uh, recall, Martin Luther, who had his distinction between the theology of glory and the theology of the cross. And it seems that although Heidegger has his own unique terminology and it takes things in his own uh, unique direction, I mean, to what extent is this... Um, <coughs> part of a variation on an old theme. Uh, that's very astute of you, brother. I think it is an, a variation on an old theme. Don't tell Heidegger. Um, <laughs> no, Heidegger has his, his own spin, of course, and part of uh, maybe the power of Heidegger's presentation is the man, the myth, the obscure language, um, those sorts of things. <laughs> Um, we also do know that you have actually named a, a number of important sources for Heidegger. So Pascal, uh, Kierkegaard, Luther are all very important to his thinking, and they all have uh, or tend to have this kind of dichotomy in mind. They see, uh, in essence, a, an opposition between philosophic, philosophical investigations of God and what is, properly speaking, theology, which is very much tied to positive revelation. Of course, this is quite the... Uh, we might say, um, contrast to the Catholic tradition, which really sees natural theology or philosophical theology without the aid of revelation, getting us to a certain point, which prepares us admirably for the advent of revelation. And uh, Aquinas will actually talk about there being a certain amount of overlap, right? And that overlap is actually called the preambula fidei, right? Some of you had that, I got that. Um, so there is a complementarity in the Catholic tradition, which Heidegger definitely does not share. He definitely uh, is really drawing on his Lutheran roots uh, in that regard. So very astute, brother. Well done. Thank you, Grandfather. Um, it seems that, at least in a lot of the inheritors of uh, mm -hmm. Heidegger's thought, especially as it's applied to theology, um, it seems that I'll, there are a lot of si or significant people who want to um, carry on this project by pointing to something in Plato, and they end up re reading it very, very wrong. Like, for example, you know, in sacramental theology, there's Chauvet who just reads the Philebus very, very wrongly. Uh, I, I think Jacques Derrida reads the Phaedrus very, very wrongly. Is there something deeper there, or, or, or what, what does it say about, I guess, Heidegger and his um, theological interpreters? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So, um, <clears throat> when I was in graduate school, the, I'm not sure what the exact phrase was, but more or less the saying was, if you want to read Heidegger's commentary on so-and-so, fill in the blank, whoever it might be, and as you know, Heidegger had commentaries on many, many people. Um, you were not reading about the person he was commenting on. You were reading about Heidegger's thoughts. So he would essentially use uh, whoever he was, happened to be favoring in that particular moment, and he tends to um, fall strangely into decades. So the 20s, he's really enthralled with Aristotle. The 30s seems to be more or less devoted to Kant. 
the 40s and, and uh, kind of thereafter seem to be at least uh, in significant uh, a sense devoted to Nietzsche. But uh, really we're getting Heidegger kind of making a, a sort of use of these thinkers. So there is something a little bit mercenary in Heidegger about that. Uh, I think there's something perhaps even more mercenary about Derrida. Um, so his deconstructivism certainly has certain, re certain resemblances to Heidegger's, um, we might say, tradition of interpretation. Uh, but uh, I think both Derrida and Heidegger, to their credit, even though this is what they do, are also fairly transparent about the fact that they are not actually, their goal is not to interpret and uh, expound and summarize a particular thinker. They're actually using that thinker to, uh, in Heidegger's vocabulary, to actually think the unthought of their thinking. Yes, this is what makes Heidegger so much fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, that does make Heidegger interesting, but of course it does make him a fairly, um, we might say, unfaithful interpreter which would definitely contrast with someone like St. Thomas, right, who doesn't necessarily agree with Aristotle in all places. There are certain places where he will subtly correct Aristotle, but for the most part, we really feel like we're getting Aristotle when St. Thomas comments on Aristotle. And I think that's true for the medievals in general. Um, that is certainly not the case for, for your, your continental tradition and certainly postmoderns. Right? And you'll, you'll find that in, in many different versions. So Levinas does the same thing. He wants to expound this idea of the other, and he uses the Platonic good and the Cartesian idea of the infinite. Now, we both know that both of those ideas were nowhere near Levinas's understanding of the other, right? So this is uh, philosophy uh, in its, we might say, gamesmanship. For your, for your paper, Father. Uh, I was just interested in your third point uh, concerning the mystery of God, which ought to be safeguarded. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on how that is different from uh, the idea of experiencing God in impossibility, which Caputo holds. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, so the, uh, the sensitivity that um, the ontotheological critique has and I think that it's also in Caputo and Carney as well, is that when we dogmatically assert that we know who and what God is, we now have mastery of God. Not only that, but we are able to deploy God as a weapon, as a justification for our own ideologies and agendas. Right? God becomes uh, somewhat at our service as an ideological tool. So there is the, the general sense that if we are more tentative in our claims to God, we aren't able to hook God in to our own projects in, in, uh, in that way. But what I have found is that if we also go too far in the negative theological direction, if we say that we can know virtually nothing about God, then we can basically conclude anything that we want about him or Perhaps even more devastatingly, we end up having a world in which God really plays no part, and therefore we end up having a kind of uh, difference without distinction between our position and atheism. That would be more or less my critique of Caputo. Um, Carney is a little bit better on this score, but I think he's still open to that problem as well. But the idea is that uh, God can be used to uh, justify whatever political ends we want, if we simply say that we know who God is and what he wants, right? This is what God wants you to do, right? Stop complaining about social justice. God wants you to simply live your life in the status quo. And this is the kind of move that uh, the ontotheological critique and postmodern approaches to, um, to the divine and to religious experience are very sensitive to. Thanks, Father Justin. Um, I had an, I don't know if it's so much a question, more of an observation. Um, so when you brought up the uh, four categories, uh, or sorry, the four criteria, rather, um, that second one about um, the intelligibility of God and its interaction with um, 
these uh, non-ontotheological um, thinkers, I, I, I can't help but notice that what they're doing is constricting God significantly more so than intelligibility could possibly do. Because in the case of, like, say, uh, Caputo's whole luck thing, if, I, if I, we were just to then put Aristotle up and, and look at his analysis of 2K and automaton of, of chance and spontaneity, now we can go up to transcendent causality without, so there's a, or rather, there's a distinction there. Um, we're in, we actually have God freer with the, the intelligibility rather than the experiential, because now I'm locking God into just luck. I, I no longer can say, well, God can work through people, through the, the, the actions of others. No, he can only work through that which is not free will or something like that. Uh, I don't know if there's much of a speaking point on this. Uh, a lot of what was said was in the, what I was thinking was in the previous question, actually. <laughs> but uh, I, I was wondering if there was a talking point at all here. Yeah, um, so uh, thinkers like Caputo, Carney, uh, Levinas, Derrida, they're actually very comfortable with this idea of God working through others. And maybe even through me, I guess. Uh, Levinas is not a, not so much with that, right? Uh, it's really the other that's important for Levinas. But for all of these um, kind of post hegelian phenomenological thinkers, uh, they tend to have a little bit of an allergy to comprehension, to uh, intelligibility, to uh, our, uh, our ability to understand. And it's not simply a skepticism towards that ability, although that's there too. It's actually to see that there is a kind of alliance in their thought between our ability and our, our wish to comprehend and our uh, tendency to dominate and our tendency towards violence. And part of my ongoing dialogue with these thinkers is to try to think of a rationality that is peaceful, a rationality that is contemplative, a rationality that does not have that inherent violence and domination to it. Because that really is the, the vision that you get, I think, in the, in the medieval tradition, is that you have uh, basically our intellect as our connection to the divine, which really is fulfilled in the activity of contemplation, which is fundamentally receptive. It's not dominating, it's not active. I think it's in many ways in the wake of a very active uh, understanding of cognition, uh, almost an imposition of our own, um, our own nature and desires on the world that you certainly get in Kant, and that's only magnified through German idealism all the way to Nietzsche, that I think colors their approach to uh, basically the possibilities and the essential goodness or lack of goodness of our intellectual faculties. Uh, Augustine Thompson, I'm the historian here, so this is... Uh, listening to this description of what ontotheology is supposed to be led me to think, uh, for the last week I've been lecturing on Augustine, uh, warning students in my class, you'll be asked why he is not an ontotheologian. Yes. <laughs> and I'm about to lecture on Anselm, and whom you said is the poster boy for this, and I completely agree with you. I think he's absolutely different than that. Um, what I'd like to say is these people... and someone would appreciate that too, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, some of these theologians need to study some history. <laughs> I, I agree. That, that comment is more relevant than you know because, uh, for instance, um, part of the ontotheological critique is, as I, 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 I express this in very general terms, essentially Heidegger's history of philosophy. And the general idea that Heidegger ends up really arriving at, we'd say certainly by the 50s, is that there is a kind of primordial experience of being that is covered over. And so, really, by the time you get to Plato, even Anaximander or Parmenides, um, the full truth of being is gone. And everyone's an ontotheologian, 
Now, it's interesting because Heidegger's ontotheological critique has inspired, for instance, a further study into areas of the history of philosophy that were relatively neg neglected in the 50s and 60s when he first really started to articulate this critique of, onto, um, of ontotheological philosophy. For instance, Neoplatonism was largely neglected. There has been a real boom in Neoplatonic studies. Um, Wayne Hankey, who has actually been here to give talks on several occasions at the DSPT, actually credits, paradoxically, Heidegger with his own undoing. That is, um, he actually inspired a revival in Neoplatonic studies, which actually was able to uncover the fact that Neoplatonism in no shape or form really can be uh, given the label ontotheological. So kudos and also whoops to Heidegger. <laughs> so, but his, his history tends to be real, really rather poor. And that's what happens when you paint history with that broad of a brush or a roller or perhaps just a spray can. <laughs> no, I'm not going to ask you what's an answer. Um, <laughs> uh, my godfather, Max Müller, who was a student of Heidegger's, uh, used to go hiking with him, and he told me that when they went into a chapel, Heidegger would always genuflect. And he said, well, uh, Professor, why do we do that? You don't believe that anymore. He says, well, there's so many people who have worshipped here before which is in a way the same point you rightly make, it is about human experience. And God might as well not exist, but human experience is everything. <clears throat> and so it's like Caputo, you know, it could be as well atheism. Um, now my sequel to that is, I mean, you are also the teacher of phenomenology. Isn't phenomenology starting that already? So if phenomenology rather than metaphysics is the first science, as Husserl says, then indeed our first and only point of reference or the ultimate foundation is human experience. Can that avoid really uh, losing metaphysics and with that God ultimately? Boy, is that a good question. Um, <laughs> so. Let me talk about the nature of phenomenology, the nature of metaphysics, and how they go together. Um, no, I'm not going to do that. But um, <laughs> let, let, let me say where, uh, generally speaking, uh, my thought has been going in uh, recent years, is Aristotle was called an empiricist for many decades. And uh, maybe not so much anymore, because empiricist tends to have a particular ring to it. But we all know here at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology what we would mean if we were to label Aristotle as an empiricist, right? Namely that Aristotle is extremely attentive to the world around him. And um, there are many portions of Aristotelian corpus that are not read, which is too bad because it actually illustrates what an empiricist he was. So read uh, lots of the um, different biological works that Aristotle wrote, and it becomes quite clear that he was a real student of the world, a real student of nature. We know that both St. Thomas and Aristotle both taught that everything begins with sense experience. This is something that Aristotle and Aquinas have in common with phenomenology. And so I think that if we have an adequate understanding of what it is we actually experience, and we don't put artificial limitations on the phenomenological method, which basically just attempts to examine experience simply as we experience it, then I think that phenomenology and metaphysics actually end up going hand in hand. Because at the end of the day, I consider them both to be, and this would need considerable qualification and definition, empirical sciences, right? In the full sense of the term Wissenschaft, in the sense of rigorous science that Husserl himself articulated. Um, so I, I think part on, of, of the problem is we have to um, continue to be good metaphysicians and good phenomenologists in order to make this happen. This, I, I couldn't possibly justify this without writing a 900-page treatise, probably 1,800 pages, and no one would read it and it would put you all to sleep. But um, 
that, that is essentially my, my own gut instinct and where I think that um, if I had to pick a position, that would be the position that I would try to defend. Well, let the conversation continue over some refreshments and let us uh, thank our uh, presenter, Father Justin. <laughs>